Hey everyone, I want to welcome you to the Miami Valley Church of Christ Wednesday midweek service. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and if we have any visitors watching with us, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we want to welcome you. The worship team will be leading uh, some songs tonight before the message, and I pray that wherever you're at, that you will pour your hearts out in praise. Join us in singing with us as we worship God.
tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleasing and I'm never alone you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you searching for answers far and wide but I know we're all searching for answers only you provide cause you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am. Perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, it's love so. still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love 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 you're a good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am I am, it's who I am, you're a good, good 
Well, amen. We're going to sing one more song before our brother Bob Irvin preaches the message for us tonight. Let's sing Lead Me to the Rock. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to uh, Wednesday evening, it's April 21st, and uh, I want to welcome everybody, um, appreciate the brothers um, asked me if I'd share tonight on, as we go on with James chapter 1 and chapter 2, alright, hey, the first thing I want to say is, is just really to appreciate all the people that take the time to put um, these services together, um, technology takes a lot. Um, it's not easy. I know they spend a lot of time. And then the people that have done the music. I, I want to especially uh, just lift up Mark George and John and Leah. Uh, Willie did a uh, song last week. That was awesome. So uh, encouraging. So I've been blown away by Mark. The guy is big time legit. He's got his own home studio. I was watching his concert a couple Sundays ago. So great job, Mark. Um so we're going to go on here in James, and um, last week I thought Maurice did a great job. Um, he did James nine, uh, excuse me, one nineteen to twenty five. We'll go on from there, okay? And um, one more quick preface: I just want to encourage people to stay connected, um, get with your relationships, stay connected. Um, actually, on Easter Sunday, I got with a brother, and we just took a prayer walk around a. Uh, a park twice and we kept our six feet but it was very encouraging it's encouraging to do things like that go out of your way to stay uh, connected there are many resources online um, I love finding like the Francis Chan talks um, on James his talks are great he did an incredible one I just want to give a quick uh, point to this called the COVID response be still and know that I am God um, that's amazing talk. If you can find that one and watch it, that Francis Chan talk, Be Still and Know That I Am God. It actually starts with the words, To the Hong Kong Church. You'll know it when you see that. It's very, very good. About 12 minutes long. Find resources like that, okay? We'll pick up where Maurice left off. We're going to try here tonight um, in about 18 to 20 minutes max to do James 1, the last two verses, and then uh, James chapter 2, 1 to 13, okay? Let's first read James 1, 26, 27. Here's what James wrote. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So that's just two verses. I wanted to stop there. James has a lot to say, obviously, in this book. 
These two verses are packed. James has a lot to say on the tongue. In fact, he'll return to that um, in chapter 3 with more. And it's almost like he hits big picture here at this point in this one verse about the tongue. Um, James says a simple thing here. We can deceive ourselves with our religion if we don't watch our tongue and how we speak to each other and the things that come out of our mouths. I know in anger. I have said things um, that are not right, and um, you know it, it, it's just not good. We all have, if we're honest. But we snap at others, at home or otherwise. Um, James actually says an interesting thing thing here. His religion is worthless. Now, I do I do not believe that we have a moment of falling that we fall in and out of grace. That's not what the Bible says. We remain saved if we stay close to Jesus. We keep our relationship. But what James says here is still true. For those moments when we don't watch our tongue, our religion becomes worthless. Worthless is the word he uses there. Um, Sharp word. I don't like hearing that. If I don't watch my tongue and how I speak to others, my religion is worthless. At least for those moments, for that time, for the effect that it has. Um, I want to read a verse here real quick. If you want to flip over to Ephesians chapter 4, we'll look at one verse to go along with this idea. So keep in mind what James has just said. If we don't watch our tongues, we can make our religion worthless. James 4 verse 29 James, uh, excuse me. Paul says, "Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up, according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen." It's a little test you can give yourself. What I'm saying right now is it going to be helpful to someone else, and is it going to benefit them? Is it going to build them up? If it has the opposite effect in any way, um, it's not good. Okay, so there's a reference. One more thing about this verse, back to James 1, if you want to flip back there. Um, James says we need to keep a tight rein on our tongue. Think of a powerful, large, powerful horse, but it's got a very uh, strong bridle and a bit and a tight rein. That horse can be controlled. That's the picture here. Our tongues can do a lot, have a lot of impact by the things we say for good or for bad. That's the picture um, versus a horse that's just running free that has no control. Um, do we keep a tight rein on our tongue? Okay. That's important during this time when we're home, we're cooped up. Uh, we get limited opportunities to talk to people. How do we talk? Let's go on to verse 27. Just go back over that one more time. James says, religion that God... Our Father accepts as pure and faultless as this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James talks about two groups here, orphans and widows. Now, a question to think about. Are those the only two groups uh, that we should be thinking about helping? Of course not. There's many people that are needy, but James puts out there couple of specific groups, orphans and widows. Um, in, in our church, in our churches, we have a number of widows. Um, it just, life happens. And do we look out for those who have needs who are, who are widows? But I think another question to ask ourselves is, um, are we looking out for the, for the needy? Okay. Who else might be among us um, that's needy? There are elderly who are shut in, we're all sort of shut-ins, right? We get that, but um, but completely shut-in. They need help getting things, getting groceries, whatever. Um, and James says this, this is good religion, okay? He says this religion that God considers pure and faultless to look after orphans and widows and the needy in their distress. There's a second thing he says with this. Keep yourself from being polluted by the world. What's that mean? It means lots and lots of things. We actually don't need to give a list here. We pretty much all know inside ourselves 
what pollutes us. We know the things that defile us. There's so much. Um, let's take technology in the online world. We're seeing tremendous amount of good that comes from it during this time as we connect with people through all these methods. But we know that there's a lot of bad stuff that we can get into as well. Okay, so it's a very much a double-edged sword. The internet does a tremendous amount of good. It also does a tremendous amount of evil. Um, and it's not only the internet. It's, it's everything. Are we staying undefiled? What things do we input into our life? What kind of music do we listen to? What kind of videos? Movies? What are we reading? There's a lot in those two verses, um, and I want to spend a little bit more time on just those two before we go on. Um, but let's sum it up, James 1, 26 and 27. James says three huge things here. Number one, keep a tight rein on our tongues. Or God says, at least for that time, our religion is worthless. Number two, look after widows and orphans and really just any group, any people we know that are needy. Um, look after them, and then to keep ourselves undefiled from the world. I actually had a two verse references to the undefiled. I forgot them. Let me give them to you. Um, Exodus 12, verse 15, and 1 Peter 1, verse 19. I've actually been reading, studying a lot 1 Peter, and so when it showed that cross-reference, I immediately hit, clicked the light bulb, and I'm like, yes, because Peter says um, Jesus was a lamb without spot or blemish. Um, and that's the idea here, religion that's without spot or blemish and keeping ourselves from being polluted by the world without spot or blemish, just as Jesus was, okay? Um, let's go on to chapter 2. I think time-wise we're doing pretty well. Um, and we're going to go on and read James 2, 1 to 7. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, Ah, here's a good seat for you. Probably down in front. That's my insertion, not the Bible. But anyway, that sort of idea. But you say to the poor man, you stand over there, or you sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? Right, let that sink in for just a minute or two. Look over this. James actually uses an incredibly, incredibly simple word picture here. It's not difficult, right? A lot of this just really speaks for itself, doesn't it? Um, and at the end of this James section, uh, just before I close out, I want to give kind of a kind of a challenge, um, a thought challenge for you, and I'll get to that um, at the end. But let's let's go through this first. The example James uses here is very very simple. Doesn't need a lot of words. Two people come in. We can favor the one. We can look down on the other. We tend to favor people that we think can or will or might do something for us um, versus people that we think don't have much to offer. They don't have much to offer us or any other people, or even if we associate with them, people might begin to whisper. We tend to do this. We tend to look different ways at uh, different people. Uh, reference back from an earlier lesson, James 1, uh, 9 to 11. He's already talked about um, the poor man and the wealthy man. James turns wisdom on its head. 
in that in that passage. He turns all conventional wisdom on its head. He says the the poor man, excuse me, the the uh, wealthy man has a low position before God. The poor man actually has a high position, and I think we get that right. The poor man is the man who's going to stay closer to God, look for God, cling to God. The the wealthy man, James says, is in a low position. Uh, because he's not looking for God. Um, I think the crux of this passage here is verse 4. If we do favor people, if we do look down at people, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Um, only we can answer that for ourselves. Um, do we make judges of ourselves by how we look at people, though? I'd like to share a little verse along with this passage as well. You'll probably find it one page earlier in your Bible. Just look to your left by one page, perhaps. It's in Hebrews 13 and verse 2. As I look here to the James, or excuse me, as I look to Hebrews 13, 2 to my left. Um, remember, excuse me, that's verse 3. Let's go to verse 2. Tell you what, let's read verse 1 as well, because it's good too. Hebrews 13, 1, keep on loving each other as brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. Interesting verse, right? Um, we tend to look down on certain people. Who's to say, hey, who's to say that God put someone on our path that is maybe even an angel, <laughs> okay? Who's to say someone that we look down on is maybe the person that um, could actually help us in some way and get closer to God, or we could help them, and yet we look down on them. Often the person that we want to lift up, and that's the person who might keep us farther from God. In whatever way, that's the person that might not help us draw closer to God. So think about how we look at people. Uh, a lot of times we don't know the effect we have. That person could be an angel, unaware to us. Um, we're going to go to the last section here, which is James uh, 2, 7 to 13. Excuse me, 8 to 13, we'll read that. Let's read on. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. Forever who, for, excuse me, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. We could obviously switch that, right? Murder might be thought of as the worst of all sins. If you do not commit murder, but you do commit adultery, you're still a lawbreaker. If you do not commit adultery, but you covet after your neighbor, you've still broken the law, right? We understand that. Paul's, uh, excuse me, James's point here is to break one part of the law means we've broken the law. We're no longer right before God. We are a lawbreaker, whether one point or ten points or a thousand points, right? And then finishing this out, um, verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Um, verse 12, the law of freedom he talks about. Very simply, Jesus gives us freedom from sin. That's all it's referring to. The law of freedom is Jesus' death on the cross has set us free from sin. So that's great stuff. That's great news. But again, uh, James closes with very sharp words. James tends to do this, right? Very sharp words. Well, he was the Lord's brother. He, uh, he probably has the right to do this. We probably can't talk as sharply as James, but you know, he says here to close this passage, um, anyone, excuse me, let's just read verse 13, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. We have to show mercy to one another, or we will not be shown mercy by God. And then he ends, though, with a positive, with a triumphant 
statement, mercy triumphs over judgment. A lot of meat in that passage. I hope it's encouraging. I'd like to give you a final thing to close here. You can call this whatever you want. You can call it a challenge if you want. You can call it a thing to do. You can call it a check myself test, um, whatever you want to call it. Okay. But here it is to kind of give us something maybe to think about, kind of pull this together. Um, for a couple more weeks, we're interacting with far less people. We are still interacting with people, though. We're probably still going to the store, the grocery. Um, you might have a service person come to your house. We had a person uh, come a couple weeks ago, Had tried to have a tremendous uh, good conversation with him. We're still interacting with people. We're taking walks in our neighborhood. We're walking by people. And here's the, here's the thought. Here's the challenge. Here's what I want to leave you with. Just ask yourself, how am I looking at that person, that person I'm walking by, that clerk in the line who looks completely worn out and tired, that pharmacy clerk. I've seen these people. <laughs> they're just completely worn out. They're harassed and they're feeling completely just worn out. How are we looking at them? How are we treating them? We're taking our, a walk in our neighborhood, um, walking by somebody. One person looks important. We go out of our way to say hi to them. Somebody else looks not important, downtrodden, maybe even sketchy, dare we might say. Mm, how do we look at that person? Do we not even smile at them? We go out of our way to stay away from them. What goes through your mind? How do you look at people? And by extension, how do you think about them? Okay, because how we how we think about people, what starts in our hearts is ultimately what comes out in our actions and in our words. So um, James has tremendous things to say. I know as we go on, there'll be great things from um, the other brothers and speakers as we go on into James 2 and 3 further. Hope this has encouraged you. Uh, God bless. Stay safe. Encourage people. And uh, look at people uh, with a positive outlook no matter what you're doing. Have a great night, guys.